<laughs> so good morning friends. Um, uh, this is your first time with us at church. Uh, just so you know at the moment we're talking about, about love, um, which, is, which is a specialised subject of mine. Um, um, yes, indeed. So, and this morning, um, in that vein, I want to talk uh, with you about the merits of strength. And by strength, I mean that thing in you that is willing to fight for what you want. Sooner or later, it always comes down to fighting. In life and in love, the things that you want don't come to you without effort. The nature of life and love is that if you want something, you have to go and get it. And the going and the getting often require a little bit of a struggle and a little bit of grit. They often require you to draw upon the deepest reserves of your strength. I think that when your marriage falls apart and you begin to negotiate your way through the pain of loneliness and the challenges of single and split parenthood, you have to fight. I think that to make it through the torture of love lost and of grief and of pain and to survive the doldrums of all of that, you have to fight. I think that to make it through the long struggle of illness and constrained economic circumstances and depression and all those things, you have to fight. Somehow, from somewhere, you have to find a slender thread of hope that you will get through this. That this will not be the end of you. And with every ounce of your strength, you need to hold on to that hope, day by day, bill by bill, perhaps date by date. And work your way towards the life and the love that you want. And this morning I want to talk about that fight. Let's have our first Bible verse up on the screen please and we'll get going. Um, so we're working our way verse by verse through the book of Ruth. That's our thing. And the story so far is that the main characters, an old woman called Naomi and her young daughter-in-law Ruth, have been going through a hard time. Everything that could go wrong in their life has gone wrong. Their husbands are both dead, they're running low on money, and even lower on hope. And so in desperation, they migrated to Naomi's hometown, the village of Bethlehem, whereupon the young Ruth immediately sets out to get for herself a better life. She realizes that she's in a bad place, and she's determined, quite rightly, that she doesn't want to stay there. So she gets up off the sofa, puts her best foot forward, and goes out on the prowl for a new man, a new job, and a new life. And last week we learned that her prowl paid off. While she was out there in the marketplace doing her thing, she caught the eye of a rich young bachelor. He liked her, she liked him. Soft music played gently in the background. <laughs> Sparks flew, they had a conversation, and you know what I mean, there was a connection. No, you don't know what I mean? I, don't, I read about it in a book, I don't know. There was just this connection between them, there was, there was, the, there was a spark for a moment that I like you, you like me, and off they went, and for nine weeks, nothing. There's this nine-week gap in the story where there's no further conversations. Having clicked in person, there's then no phone calls, no text messages, no emails, no further talk between those two. And when you're checking your phone every five minutes to see if he called or she texted, nine weeks is a long time. And time matters. Because in this particular story, for the young Ruth, time is running out. She's a temp. She's got a short-term contract working on a farm that belongs to the rich young bachelor. At the end of the nine weeks when the harvest is over, Ruth loses both her job and her daily contact with the rich young eligible bachelor. And so with that clock ticking, tick tock, tick tock people, we read the opening sentence of Ruth chapter three. Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, says, my daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. 
Now, when she says, I must find a home in which Ruth will be well provided for, what she means is she must find Ruth a man to marry, and what better man to marry than a man who's got lots of money and um, a big balance on his credit card. <coughs> but what I want you to notice in this sentence, and notice it well, please, is the phrase she uses, I must, I must. And I want you to notice that because at the start of the story, this wasn't a woman who, who ever spoke the phrase, I must. She wasn't an I must kind of person. This was a person who at the start of her story blamed God for everything in her life. You know, it was God's fault that her husband died. It was God's fault that she had no money. It was God's fault that every day of her life was a painful struggle. And she was similarly fatalistic towards her young daughter-in-law. She said, well, I hope you get things better. I hope your life turns around. I hope you find a better future. I hope, I hope, I hope. You know, toss your pennies into the fountain and see what luck brings you. Well, there's none of that nonsense in this sentence. Not now. This woman in this sentence has finally got a grip on herself. She's finally realized that she alone is responsible for her own life and her own happiness. And so as she looks at the future, she does so with an I must frame of mind. And there is a lesson in this. The fact is, some will tell you differently, but they're lying. The fact is, you don't know what God will do. And you don't know what luck will bring you. For better or for ill. You don't. And so the thing to focus on. Are the things that you must do. Sometimes in life you need to give luck a little helping hand. And so when she talks about what she must do. She's saying as she must in her theological worldview. Look I know there's a God. I do. I get it, I believe in him, I pray to him, I'm 100% signed on board for all of that. And I further know that some people in this life get good luck and some people in this life get bad luck. I know, how could I not believe that? But I can't do anything about that stuff. God does his thing, fate does its thing, I have no control over those things. I have 100% control, however, over the things I do. And so I'm not going to sit on my sorry backside and wait for fate to do its thing in my life. Not at all. I am going to get involved in the unfolding story of my own life because I now realize that if I want things to get better for me, there are things I must do. When you decide that you must do something, the first thing I suppose you need to get yourself is a plan. Here's the plan. We read in the next sentence that Boaz, with whose woman you have worked, is a relative of ours. Then the old, the old bird says, Tonight, he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. So in other words, the man you're interested in is working night shift tonight. He's going to be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Now, winnowing barley on the threshing floor, that's farm stuff. I don't know anything about farm stuff. I don't want to know anything about farm stuff. You don't need to know anything about farm stuff. But I've mentioned that phrase, winnowing barley on the threshing floor, so many times in the last 60 seconds that you should have clued in by now that there's something going on here. The plan has got something to do with a man winnowing barley <laughs> on a threshing floor. So, in an ancient agricultural economy like Bethlehem, get this, the end of harvest season, when you winnowed barley on the threshing floor, was in their culture what... Um, spring break in Miami is in our culture. <laughs> Understand? Uh, uh, what Mardi Gras New Orleans is in our culture. You know, it was a time traditionally of high spirits and low morals. 
a time when otherwise good, decent, hard-working people let down their hair for a little bit, blew off some steam and did things that they wouldn't otherwise normally do in their day-to-day -day life. For example, have a look at this. Uh, this comes from a later part of the Bible, and in this part of the Bible, um, uh, the, the writer is criticizing Jewish culture. And he's saying to his culture, you've been unfaithful to God, and the place you've been unfaithful, there's been prostitutes um, at every threshing floor. So there is in ancient literature this, this close connection between the threshing floor, where barley is winnowed, and bad moral behavior. And so for that reason, if you lived in the ancient world, and you heard the phrase, winnowing barley at the threshing floor, your mind would not have immediately gone to agricultural work. It would instead have gone to the kind of behaviour that, if you're unlucky, ends up on Facebook the following day. <laughs> so the plan then, coming from this old woman who's scheming, that Ruth should go at night to the place where men blow off steam, at the end of the harvest season, the place where men do questionable things that they would not otherwise do. But before she goes out and does all that, notice what the old bird says. Next sentence. Wash, perfume, and get on your best clothes. Now, if I were Ruth, I'd be offended at this point. What Naomi is basically saying here is that tonight, you've got to go out and try and get yourself a man and the first thing you should do, darling, is, is have a wash, seriously. <laughs> like, like, is a mystery he hasn't called for nine weeks? <laughs> In fact, let's scrub around the wash and let's just cover it with perfume. And get some nice clothes on. So aside from the obvious business of making yourself look as good as you possibly can... Look at the text. What's going on here? This isn't just about a woman prettying herself up. There's something subtle happening. In chapter 1 of the story, we discovered that Ruth had lost her husband. And when you've lost your husband, what does that make you? A widow. And in certain cultures, in the ancient world, and in the modern too, I suppose... Widows tend to wear certain types of clothes. Uh, sometimes for a short season of life, sometimes for the rest of their lives. Uh, those of you who come from Sicilian backgrounds and so on perhaps are familiar with this. There's always some old lady in the village and it's, she's got one outfit. And it doesn't make anyone burn with desire. And that's precisely the point. Nothing says unavailable. Quite like the black outfit of a widow. So what the older Naomi is saying to the young widow Ruth is, Honey, it's time to put away the black widow's outfit and time to look out the little black dress. <laughs> time to get out there again and let this man know you are looking for love. So that's phase one of the plan. You with me so far? Make yourself look as good as you can. Why not? Then we get to phase two. Go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you're there until he's finished eating and drinking. So, <clears throat> let me translate that for you slightly differently. <laughs> Honey, if you're going to chat this guy up tonight, don't try it when he's sober. No offence, because when he's fully sober, you've got no chance. Wait till he's had a few, your chances will increase exponentially. I am offended at this. So that's phase two. Then in phase three, the advice is tantalisingly ambiguous, packed full of double meaning. Verse four, the advice is when he lies down... Note the place where he is lying, then go and uncover. Stop on the word uncover. This story was first told thousands of years ago to Hebrew-speaking audiences. 
And the word that the storyteller uses for uncover is, um, it is a deliberately adult word. It is a word that you use in ancient literature to describe the thing you do when you uncover something to see what's under there. I shall leave it at that. And even if you don't, I mean, even if you read this, I mean, even if you're as prudish as prudish can be, and even if, for the best of reasons, you wish to read this ancient story in the most innocent way imaginable, you still, at this point, end up in a dangerous place. You still end up in a risky situation. Doll yourself up, wait until he's had a few drinks, wait until he's lost his inhibitions, creep into his room and uncover him. The part that she is to uncover, notice, are his feet. Uh, those of you who read ahead in the story will, will note puzzlingly that feet crop up a lot in the story. That's a clue that the writer wants you to know, that feet play an important part in the story. Have I used the word feet too much? <laughs> This means little to us, but this is a clue to the ancient Hebrew audience that, that something else is going on. Um, you know how sometimes words mean different things in different contexts? Remember, I think I got a photo of John Candy. Do you have a John Candy photo? Yeah. <laughs> Remember that scene in planes, trains, and automobiles? Those aren't pillows! Well, sometimes pillows are pillows. And sometimes pillows are something else. Um, in the language of the Old Testament, in fact, in all ancient Near Eastern languages, sometimes the word feet means feet, the thing you stand on. However, oftentimes the word feet is a euphemism for a gentleman's unmentionables. And this is one of those occasions. So the plan is for her to uncover the quote-unquote feet of Boaz, and having uncovered that, she is then to lie down. And again, in Hebrew, the phrase lie down is deliberately ambiguous. It is in English too, I suppose. When you lie down uh, in bed, sometimes you are sleeping and sometimes you are not. And then it gets worse. And this isn't just because we're in a post-Me Too generation now. I think, I think certainly in every generation, everyone in this church has ever lived in, this is bad, what comes next. No way to sugar this up. She then says, having gone into his room when he's had a few and uncovered him and leaned down and all that stuff, you should await his instructions. Notice the phrase at the end. He will tell you what to do. Are you... Are you kidding me? <laughs> Just... We read the Bible with modern eyes. And our modern eyes are rightly repelled. Oh, this is wrong. It's in the Bible, but it's wrong. Imagine this conversation happening in your home. Imagine a young woman in her late teens saying to her mother, Hey mum, there's this guy at school, he's, you know, he's kind of cute, I like him. You know, what should I do about it? Imagine mum saying this. Here's what you do. <laughs> Get on some sexy clothes. Wait till he's had a few. Sneak into his bedroom. Lie down. And then do whatever he tells you to do. Comfortable? No? I am deeply uncomfortable now. Ruth apparently thinks this is normal. She says, I will do whatever you say. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. She obeyed. And when I was a kid in church, and we went to Sunday school and we were told these stories, it was this aspect of her character that was always highlighted for us as children. She obeyed. Boys and girls, it's good to obey. Boys and girls, Ruth obeyed, and so too 
You must obey. Be good boys and girls. That's what we were taught in church growing up. What our teachers failed to mention is that what she was obedient in was the art of seduction. They glossed over that. And I'm not glossing over it. Because it needs saying that this is not a clean story. And that needs saying. Because fighting for the things you want in this life rarely are What are we to think of a woman who goes out at night dressed to kill and lies down next to a man without her, his permission and does whatever he tells her to do? What are we to make of this? Next sentence. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, the idea here is that he has thus far had a good night. He is not drunk, but neither is he completely sober. He is not post-Mandarin stuffed, but he is pleasantly fool. He is mellow. We are to imagine him at this point with a smile on his face, perhaps lounging on his Muskoka chair, staring up at the stars, bathing in the quiet euphoria of a good harvest season. And then at the end of a perfect night, he goes over to lie down at the far end of the green pile. And while he's doing all that, eating his food, drinking his drink, sucking on his after-dinner cigar, settling down for the night. We as readers of the story know that lurking in the shadows is a woman watching him. Waiting. This is creepy. <laughs> it is. And as she watches him fall asleep, the story then says that she approached quietly and covered his feet and lay down. At this point, the writer of the story mercifully spares all of us the details. His language is deliberately ambiguous. Instead, he fasts forward to a specific period of the night. What does the text say? When did what happened next happen? In the middle of the night. This is a key phrase, because in the stories of the Bible, the middle of the night is always the moment of reckoning. The middle of the night is the time between the past and the future, the moment when anything can happen and everything can change. For example, in the Bible, it is in the middle of the night that the angel of death kills the firstborn of Egypt. It is in the middle of the night that Jacob wrestles with God. It is in the middle of the night when the bridegroom arrives, spelling disaster for the unprepared virgins. It is, according to Job, in the middle of the night when death stalks its prey. You understand, to talk in the Bible about the middle of the night is to talk about a time of great danger and great opportunity. A moment in which one's life can change for the better or for the worse. This is not a clean story. This is a dangerous story and this is a dangerous moment. A young woman is lying down without his permission next to a drunk man in a place where men do things they would not otherwise do. <coughs> so, verse 8, in the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned and there was a woman lying at his feet. How will he react? What will he do? And remember, this is the point in the story where Ruth is supposed to be submissive. This is the part where she's meant to keep quiet and do whatever he tells her to do. Ruth, however, scores one for girl power. <laughs> Rather than waiting for him to tell her what to do, she immediately tells him what he wants to do. Which she wants him to, her, I'm getting my hymns and hers mixed up. <laughs> Rather than waiting for orders, she starts giving them. Remember, men are stupid. You need to spell it out for them. So anyway, he wakes up. He, he feels this 
woman, he hopes it's a woman, lying, <laughs> lying there next to him. And so he says to her, who are you? Who, who are you? Please say Jennifer Aniston, please say Jennifer Aniston. <laughs> who are, he has no idea who this is. Then she says, I am your servant Ruth. Spread the corner of your garment over me. Now, if you were an ancient Hebrew, and you were there when this story was first told, you would know exactly what she was saying when she said, spread your garment over me. In that ancient culture, to talk about spreading your garment over someone was to talk always and only about marriage. So what Ruth is saying in the middle of the night, mm -hmm. in a dangerous moment laden with fear and opportunity, is marry me. And she is saying it with a beautiful play on words. The last, and as far as we know, only time these two spoke. Boaz said to her, having taken note of her constrained circumstances, that his wish for her was for God to spread his wings over her and protect her. It's an old Hebrew saying, may God cover you in the shadow of his wings. And now she is saying, remember you said that to me? Remember you wished for me, to God, to, for God to spread his wings over me, and protect me and provide for me? Well now, in the middle of the night, in a time of danger and opportunity, I am asking for you to be the answer to your own prayers. I am asking for you to cover me, to protect me, to provide for me. And the rationale she gives for this proposal is that you are a guardian redeemer of our family. More on that next time we talk on it. For now, let me draw your attention. You've probably got there already, actually. But if you haven't, let me draw your attention to the extent that Ruth is putting herself out here. It's dark. It's a dangerous place where dangerous things happen. And a servant is asking her master for marriage. This is a risky move, man. This is risky. And the good things in life often are. Life often is. Love often is. Anything worthwhile often is. When we talk about love, what are we talking about? We're talking partly about you taking your heart and giving it over to another person. And when you give your heart away to another person, you have no way of controlling what they do with it. They might hold it gently and treat it as their most valued possession. Or they might stand on it and treat it as worthless garbage. And to the very end of this sentence, we have no way of knowing how this risk will play out. This is probably the part of the story where they'd cut to the commercials or where the credits would roll and say, to be continued. I mean, she has taken a risk here. People don't go there for marriage. They go there for something else. There is tension here. But in the tension, would we not say that love is worth it? We would, in honesty, have to say that love can be one of the most painful experiences of our species. Some of the worst times in all of our lives have been times in which love has not worked. There is no doubt about that. And we don't think these things at the time... But the decision to fall in love, the decision to give your heart away to another person, is always to take the risk of one day turning into pain. Sooner or later, life makes losers of us all. And that notwithstanding, that, that true as it is, we would all still say, would we not? And our saying would be backed up by, by science, that love is still worth it. Love is still life's greatest prize and greatest treasure. So Ruth's put herself out there. She really has. She's offered her heart, her life, 
her safety, everything that she has to this man in the dark. And now she awaits his response. Next sentence. The Lord bless you, my daughter. This kindness is greater than that you showed earlier. For you have not run after the younger men, be they rich or poor. So we learn in this sentence now that Boaz was a little bit older than Ruth. And being an older rich man, why is he single? Perhaps he's resigned himself to that kind of life. Perhaps after several unlucky relationships and a couple of broken hearts, he has reconciled himself to ending his years as he lived them alone without the warmth of a companion. That's a guess. But it does interest me that he seems overly grateful in this moment. You notice that? This woman appears beside him in his bedroom and proposes marriage. And the first thing he says is, thank you. <laughs> oh my goodness, thank you. Comes across as a little bit needy. Which is fair enough. Fair enough. Because if you're not willing to be vulnerable, then you're unlikely to experience all that love has to offer. There's no way around that. And so he says, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask, and all the people of my town will know you are a woman of noble character. All right. All right. Woman of noble character. Here we go. <laughs> what is that? Sorry, I'm pausing so you can get your notebooks out, ladies. <laughs> what, is, what is that? Uh, those of you who've read the Bible a little bit will recognize this phrase from the well-known 31st chapter of Proverbs. And with that chapter... Um, uh, basically says is that a woman of noble character is, what is she? She is confident, she's a good wife, she's a great mother, she does crafts, she bakes, she knows how to make money on the real estate market at the weekend, she sells jewellery down at some farmer's fair. Um, uh, she's basically a hybrid version of Martha Stewart, Oprah and Ivanka Trump. Um, and, and there are books uh, about how you as a Christian woman can be a woman of noble character. Here's the number one best-selling Woman of Noble Character book on Amazon. It's called Becoming the Woman God Wants Me to Be. That is ridiculous. Um, I, as though the Bible gave one picture, one template of, of what you are meant to be as a person. And uh, anyway, this book, uh, very influential among female Christians, is a guide, allegedly, to being a woman of noble character. And the chapters of this book cover vital topics like taking care of your personal appearance, making sure that you say your prayers, making sure your family has nutritious food to eat, learning how to make money on the real estate market, having a successful home-based jewellery business, planning for your retirement, blah, blah, blah. It sells well, folks. In other words, according to this being a woman of noble character is about being an amazing homemaker. But, question, what if that's not your story? What if your story, like so many stories in the Bible and like so many stories in this life, is not simple? What if you gave it your best and ended up with the worst? What if life treated you unfairly? What if, what if it's not perfect? What if you don't fit into these silly, naive blueprints? I ask the question because the phrase woman of noble character is an English phrase. It is a loosey-goosey translation of a Hebrew phrase. Eshet Hayil. 
Eshet Chayil. Eshet Chayil in Hebrew does not mean a woman who bakes. It means a woman who fights. A woman who is strong. A woman who can make it. A woman who is tough. Always slightly tougher than the toughness of her environment. Eshet Chayil. And this is a phrase I can get behind and admire. It seems to me that being a strong woman and being a perfect woman in a perfect environment are not necessarily nor always the same thing. And so I say to those of us who are struggling in different circumstances, doing in difficult circumstances rather, doing the best that we can to make the best of things, Eshet Chayil. Struggling in a horrible relationship, going through a season of life that's just terrible. Eshet Chayil. <coughs> Fighting an illness that in your darker moments you wonder if it's going to take you. Eshet Chayil. Worrying about your children and the worry never ends. Eshet Chayil. Not knowing how you're going to pay the next bill. Not knowing how you're going to make it through the next month, the next year. Scared about the future. Eshet Chayil. There is always more in you than the circumstances that surround you. And you can fight. And you can be strong. And in your strength. Eshet Chayil. In the Bible, Eshet Chayil is a phrase of, it's a phrase of celebration. It's a verbal Victoria Cross that the communities used to point at women who were tough in the community. And they said, look at her. Her life is miserable, but Eshet Chayil. She did what she had to do to survive in a season of life that was horrible. Eshet Chayil. Those are the stories <coughs> worth celebrating. seems to me to be obvious that we shouldn't let people judge us for doing what we had to do to survive in difficult seasons of our life. Fair? In these stories in the Bible, complex and unsimple as they are, we are reminded that God is with us in all the episodes of life, not just the pretty ones. That, my imperfect friends, is good news for you. The gospel, remember, is good news for bad people. People like you, people like me. Anyway, I'll stop now and pick up. Uh, actually, in a couple of weeks, next week, we're going to do some Eastery stuff. We're going to get Eastery as a church, which is good. Stay strong, friends. Stay strong. Keep going and keep going. Bless you.